slow it down, focus on embedding, focus on making the changes, and that's how you get lasting results. Business of Architecture, episode 426. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. Of course, this podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, the leading business consultancy for architects that helps small firm owners structure their practice and their teams for freedom, creative fulfillment, and financial reward. Let me ask you a question. What is the key to having a successful architectural practice? Of course, there are many ways to answer this question, and of course, everyone defines success differently. Let me ask you a question. What does success mean to you? Consider this question for a moment. What does success mean to you? I'll guess that your definition of success doesn't include being financially stretched, burned out, or unfulfilled. Recently, I heard an interview with the wonderful entrepreneur Oprah Winfrey, where she said something that really stuck with me. She said, as she was talking about her career and her success, she said, no one succeeds alone. And she repeated it twice. No one succeeds alone. Now, in the past, as a natural introvert, this advice has been difficult for me to hear because I'm not naturally gifted in working with other people. So there's an element of this where I'd rather be the guy locked away in a room somewhere who doesn't have to interface with anyone. And I know that many architects feel the same way. We're not the loud, glad-handing, party-going architects who are slapping everybody's hand, kissing babies. So... Consider that however you define success, that you can't have success alone as an island. What is the key to building then a team of people around you, a team of team members, clients, and associates? That's one of the things we touch on in this interview today. Alex Gore, who's the co-host of the Inside the Firm podcast, interviewed me for his podcast, Inside the Firm. And I also thought that I'd repost that interview here for you on the Business of Architecture show. One of the biggest challenges of running a practice today is the fight for talent, the battle for getting the right people that can be able to deliver the work, people that will want to stay with you long term. And so this is one of the topics that we cover in today's interview. I tell a little story about an architecture, a colleague who I was speaking to who had several key team members quit or get poached by other firms and the the havoc and the devastation that this was wrecking on his firm. and. And really, as I talk with Alex about this on the show, we're going to talk about the the missing piece that keeps firm owners from being able to retain their team members long term. If you're a podcast listener, which you probably are since you're listening to this, you'll definitely want to check out the Inside the Firm podcast with Lance Psycho and Alex Gore, where they share behind the scenes stories and interviews as they build their design build firm, F9 Productions. So have a listen, let me know what you think, and as always, here is today's show. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Firm. This is your Monday morning edition. I am Alex Gore. I am here with Enix Sears, who is the creator and host of the Business of Architecture podcast. He's also the creator, or slash co-creator, we'll ask him about that, about the online business course, Smart Practice Method. He's a longtime friend of the show, and most importantly, he's a father of 47 children. Enoch... (laughs) Welcome to Inside the Firm. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, those 47 kids, a lot of mouths to feed, let me tell you. A lot you. of mouths. I think it's really six, but I didn't know. So I, I just add. Them. Yeah, we have we have six children. We have six mm-hmm. children now. Oldest one is going away to high school, sorry, college this year. So it's a big change for us. We're actually going down the curve now. Instead of getting more kids, ah. we're actually getting less. So we're going five. from six to five. What? And then what's the youngest? Youngest How one old? is nine years old. So we okay. have oldest one's 18, youngest one is nine. So we have a kind of at about 18 months apart, two years apart down the line, man. Nice. Got, got the full six pack happening. Six is the sweet spot. Is that what you tell people? Because people I don't know, are if, like, I don't know if there's anything. Yeah, I don't know if there's a sweet spot about it, but uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. Uh, when I grew up, I come from a family of nine. So this, I'm kind of used to the chaos and the mayhem, but my my childhood was kind of, kind of troubled. There's some aspects of it that weren't idyllic. And so I'll tell you, Alex, I really appreciate, and it's been one of my goals in life to just really have a great family, you know, and I know we can't have everything perfect, but fatherhood, parenthood for me has been super important. And so it's one of my key core values, which is, you know, I want to, I want to spend time with my kids. 
I don't want to be the father who's never there. I remember I had a friend when I was a kid and he said, you know what, you know, my dad, number one, he doesn't make much money. And number two, he's not even with us that much. It'd be one thing if we had one or the other, maybe we had a dad who made a lot of money, maybe not the best, but at least he made money for us. Or we had a dad who was poor and actually spent time with us. He's like, we're poor and my dad doesn't spend time with us. And I yeah. thought, oh, I'm like, I don't want to be that. So I want to be a great provider for my family. And I want to be able to spend time with them. You know, the quality time, it goes so quick. Yeah, I think that's one of the main reasons uh, why what you're doing is so important. I have a couple of kids and I want to spend good quality time with them. My dad actually did a good job. And sometimes he talks about grandpa, who is his dad, and said, grandpa never watched us at all, never paid attention. And I was just on a family vacation talking to my grandma on my mom's side. And she always has these stories about World War II and, you know, all that. And it just hits me how much of a different era it is. And what I want to, if I have a conversation with my dad is like, hey, dad, maybe grandpa worked all the time because that's what he had to do. And there wasn't internet courses. There wasn't figuring out how to level your game. I, you know, people did it. People were successful, but... Um, I also think about if you see a lot of immigrant families, like the dads will work seven days a week, you know, manning the store, doing whatever, um, and have large families. So it's not always an option to do what your goal is, is saying, which I think is all of our goals. I think we just can't maybe fault some previous generations uh, for trying to struggle by. Um, any thoughts on that? I agree. I mean, to each his own. I know my father did the best he could. Uh, his father did the best he could with what he had. Right now, we live in a time where there's never been more abundance. Yeah, yeah. You know, with never been more abundance, there's never been more access to resources. And so like now is the time. Now is the time to shed any excuses for not having the perfect ideal life that you want. It's time to leave those excuses behind and get out there and make some stuff happen. Yeah. What is your business mission? and what is your life mission or are they the same? Ah, that's a very good question. All right. So our business mission is to cure the business ignorance that causes architectural poverty, right? And so ultimately what that means is that our mission at Business of Architecture, our business mission is that we realize that oftentimes, especially for small firm owners, all the complexity of business gets in the way of the architecture, meaning that it impacts the actual quality of the built environment that architects are able to produce. Because when they're spending time on emails, answering phone calls, putting out fires, dealing with building officials or contractors who are telling them they did it the expensive way, clients who are telling them that they're too expensive, they need to lower their fees while the firm next door is already offering it for half price. Like All of these things combined ultimately get in the way of what an architect can do. And so at Business of Architecture, our goal is to make all that simple for practice owners so they can ultimately be better architects and just have fun doing the architecture. That's the business mission. Yep. Do you have a, a life mission? I or do. So my, yeah, my life purpose, I call it my purpose. Yeah. And my purpose is to inspire magnified connection. And what I mean by that is I mean magnified connection, people one to another, understanding magnified connection with ourselves, and then magnified connection with the higher power, whether you call that God, whether you call it the inner voice, but going through life with a sense of purpose and connection. And the reason why, Alex, this has been so important for me is because I've lived a lot of my life feeling disconnected, just feeling alone, feeling like I didn't fit in in some way, shape or form. In some ways I do fit in, other ways I don't, right? But just having this feeling at the bottom of my soul that there's something that I'm missing. There's some, some, some missing piece that I couldn't figure out. And now as I'm about middle-aged, kind of turning 45 this year, I'm understanding that the key there for me is really connection. It's connection to my inner voice. It's moving away from being a people pleaser who wants to just do whatever other people think or tries to do things to look good, but actually being clear on who I am as a person, what I want out of life, and the speaking that out into the world so then I can attract the kind of people that I want to have into my life. So that's just a little sneak peek of what I mean by inspiring magnified connection. And for me, it really is a lot about connecting with the inner voice because I think we all have a channel to God and, um, and there's, there's a lot of power that comes from listening to our own inner voice as opposed to constantly asking for permission from the world to do what it is that we want to do. Yeah. I, I feel like that 
links strongly to uh, firms too, meaning that was a personal goal, a personal mission, but I don't know if people are connected with the mission of their own firms. They're kind of just picking up what they can and just kind of like what we were talking about at the fathers, just kind of running with what they had, trying to make the best of it. Yeah, um, absolutely. Do you see that too? You work with a lot of different firms. Absolutely. You know, I was talking with, I was actually talking with uh, an architect recently who uh, is at the, let's say at the tail of his, end of his career. So the golden age of it's interesting nowadays when you're in your sixties, that's like when you're at the peak of life, sixties now is like mm -hmm. the new forties, you know? Yeah. So he's kind of at that stage and he's had a long and successful career as an architect. He's always run a small firm. He's always delighted his clients. He's always been about making sure that client service and satisfaction is number one. So as a result of that, he gets lots of repeat work, which is great. He's built a really great little business. But just over the past two weeks, he's had three. So it's a small firm. I think he says eight people total. He's had three of those eight people quit. Can you imagine three of the eight people quit? One of them, he expected it was a guy who decided to retire. So a longtime employee who ended up retiring. The other person got a job at a local school district that is paying her double what he was paying her and she's doing less demanding work. So this was like literally his, his right-hand person. This is the woman who she interacted with all the clients. She had great client relations. She knew how the, how the buildings were put together. She knew the whole process. She was like literally the person who was practically running the firm. And she left because she got an offer, like I said, at the school district that was paying her almost twice as much. And of course, doing work that was much less challenging. As you know, architecture is no laughing matter. And then the third person he lost was a drafts person who was poached by a competing firm. Right now, we know that people are out looking, you know, there's a shortage of labor. And so again, they gave him a much more lucrative job offer. He ended up jumping ship, you know, yeah. and it's terrible because now he's this entire week, he's spending at the office until late, late at night, just trying to get the projects done. It's an enormous amount of stress. Just when he feels like he should be enjoying passing on his firm to the next generation, starting to cash in on all the hard work he's done over all the years, it's the opposite. Now he's in the firm more than ever. Now he feels the deadlines more than ever. He's having that added stress. And ultimately what that comes to what we've seen Alex, after researching hundreds of firms and working with over 203 different small architectural practices is that mission and purpose is important and that people today are looking for something that matters. They're looking for meaningful work, Yep. right? They're looking for something that gives them a sense of purpose. It, um, I have two, I have a comment in the question. So I've seen some of the posting for, for government jobs and some of the uh, salary offers are actually getting like quite high. And what's kind of crazy about that is I have dealt, I've said it many times on the podcast, you know, they might get paid, they don't get paid 2X where we are, but um, it's like 2X, but half the work. Like, and the other thing too, with the mission and purpose, I could never, it, some of, and mainly it comes from the planning department, not the building department. Building department's normally straightforward and just code stuff. And that's, that's all fine. The planning department is just, it's soul crushingly like dumb comments, just like the worst things ever. And that like the, it, the mission, the mission and purpose doesn't seem worth the money in a, in a lot of equations, but it, it concerns me this trend that cities are not pushing through projects enough. We have a housing crisis, not just in California, all over the place. And then they just keep adding and they don't get any more efficient at all. So not only is it taking staff away from the production side, then it's just adding on to the burden on that production side that it just got taken away from. Um, I know <clears throat> me and you, we have small voices, can't do much about that, but I think it's an issue that, that people should be aware of. Um, and you can riff on that if you want to, but my second question was, what kind of advice did you have for this gentleman going through this? Crisis. Okay. Well, first of all, let me just say that Alex Gore's voice is not a small voice. So everyone <laughs> listening today, let's rise up in arms. We've got to change the system yeah. here. You know, okay. What advice do I have for someone in this situation? Here's the thing. People today are looking for leadership. 
People today are looking for a mission that they can latch on to. And when I look at what went wrong here, what was the root cause? Why would someone leave a job to go pay for something that costs twice as much? As you mentioned, I mean, look, those jobs are great for some people. And I appreciate that. And we need the people who can go work at the city or work in the government jobs or go work for the school district as an architect. Those are fantastic jobs. They were never something that I was interested in personally, right? But here's the thing. If the firm where you're working at, if you feel engaged to a sense of purpose there, people will do literally anything for a cause that they believe in. I think Napoleon said that men will do anything for a little piece of ribbon on their chest. Well, yeah. it's not too different. It's not too different of a concept is that we want a feeling of purpose, right? We want a sense of meaning in our life. And there's many firms that just don't offer that, you know, for whatever reason, they've never understood the importance of mission. They never taken the opportunity to identify what is their firm's mission? Why do they matter? Why does what they do really matter at the end of the day? Why not just go, you know, be a janitor somewhere, go work at a fast food restaurant or go become an accountant. You know, obviously there's the creative aspect of enjoying architecture. We wouldn't want to do anything else, but when you look at it and when I've realized this, I, I understood that like really how much of my time as an architect was really spent doing creative work. It was actually very small. The rest of it was client coordination. It was dealing with planning departments, fire details, you know, the fire marshal, like there's so many different things that went into it. So to be able to deal with the boredom for some of us, that's boredom for other people. They love that, but whatever it is in our job that we have to do that we don't enjoy doing, there's a certain monotony there. What's going to get us through that is a sense of passion, a sense of purpose is something that that's a higher calling that we feel like we're involved in because as human beings, we're creatures that need meaning. We want to wake up and we want to feel like what we're doing matters and that it's important. So my piece of advice to any firm owner who wants to create a culture where you're not going to have your staff poached, it's not necessarily going to be about paying them more. It will be about understanding exactly what it is that gets them fired up about their position and making sure they can get that within your world. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and I would take that all the way to the job interview. I interviewed a amazing female at NDSU um, and just blown away at the, the skill and, and level of detail um, and just the work of the projects. And I finally asked because I, I knew what you were hinting at. So what do you, what projects do you want to work on? And that's normal question that you ask, but like I put emphasis on it and it was uh, she's in track and, pole vault and, and all that stuff. Uh, she wants to design sports stadiums and track stadiums and all that. Well, that's great. That's amazing. Would love to have her work at our firm, but that that's not what our form, firm does. You know, especially with that talent level, you can go work at those firms. Those firms would be, you know, happy to have you. So it's very key. And to, to echo that too, one lesson I learned that we're kind of forgetting, and maybe this will uh, get me back on it was at, at Studio Daniel Liebskin, where I worked. He always said, Do one fun project a year. And when we did that in the beginning, those were always the ones that got so much press. Like almost in the first five years, every fun project we did either landed us on TV or on a magazine. Like because that's we just put your passion into it. Um, and then, you know, we grow, we get bigger, blah, blah, blah. But I, I think. And we've, we've tried to do that. We've had little fun projects, but I think it needs to be like a bigger kind of, kind of deal. Um, I love that. I love that. Yeah. Uh, two part question. I'll start with just the, the first part. If someone asked you for your advice and they said, I'm branching out on my own to start my own architecture firm. What, and let's just say they're seven years in, who knows, uh, they have their architecture license and all that. What key things would you tell them to make sure you have kind of set up in the business sense, not in the design sense, now to set you up for success in the future? Oh, that's a great, great question. And that was, look, I can speak to, to my failures in that department. So okay. back in 2009, I was let go from the firm where I was working at. And I thought I had the brilliant idea. It would be great to go out on my own. And so I went from having the ideal dream job where I was down in Panama, I was managing a construction team. I was running some different projects and having lots of fun, working half days, surfing in the afternoon. It was like a dream come true. And I went to that to literally within the matter of months, 
being unemployed, being on unemployment, having to apply for food stamps. So we could, by the way, we never ate better in our life. Just, just, just to let you know, but uh, so <laughs> we went, man, the budget that they have for people to go on, it's like enormous. We were eating like steak and everything like, this is great. Anyway. So sorry, I, I have to ahead, add on to please. that. My roommate in college, because there was different eras. Uh, yeah. So I was typical poor college student and I was so upset because uh, my friend got financial aid and he could afford milk and he could buy steak on Friday night. And I was like, you <laughs> high class <laughs> person having you a steak class. and milk. I know. This is crazy. Steak this. and milk instead of top ramen and what? Yeah. What, tang, uh, Kool-Aid. Just water. And water. Water and ramen. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I know. Exactly. <laughs> Well, you know, and it's, it's the sacrifices we make. Right. And so as you can imagine for me to go from having uh, before I had like basically a six figure job, I was late 20. So I was very highly paid at the time for what I was doing. And to go from that, where we were kind of living high, we were living, I'm like, this is the dream job to going to being on, on food stamps, wondering where I'm going to pay for my next meal. And I, I remember it was the Christmas of that year. I sat and I was looking up at the fan. It's early in the Christmas morning because what I had done to make ends meet is I got a paper route and I did substitute teacher in the, during the daytime. And then also while I hustled side projects in architecture to try to build up my own practice. And as I sat there and just feeling sorry for myself, you know, thinking, geez, what did I do wrong? And I'm watching the ceiling fan as it slowly goes around the, the ceiling. And what I'm realizing is that it wasn't that I didn't know about architecture. It wasn't that I didn't understand how codes worked how programming works, how buildings get put together, proper egress requirements, all of that, yeah. right? It wasn't that I didn't know that. It was simply that I didn't know the in and outs of how to manage and make money in a practice. I didn't know what, we, what I've come to discover is the business side of architecture. And so for anyone who's going out on their own, what I, what I suggest that they do is they get a love. They get a love for business or partner with someone who does love it. Right. And the cool thing about it is that you can, it's a love that can be acquired. Cause a lot of times, if you would have asked me 12 years ago, Enoch, all you need to do is get a love of business. I would have said, that sounds like torture. I mean, I didn't go, I didn't get an MBA for a reason. I went to architecture school for a reason. I don't want to have to learn about business. I thought business was dealing with spreadsheets and numbers and accounting statements and financial management and all that completely bored me. What I didn't understand is that business is about so much more than that. It uses the same creative problem-solving skills that we love to use as architects, but it applies them in so many different ways to strategic opportunities, to relationships, to leading and guiding and coaching people. There's so much opportunity to grow and so many exciting things that can be done in business, but we never learn it. No one ever teaches us. And it's for good cause, because if we did, we wouldn't have any time to learn the architecture. So that would be, my, my answer would be not necessarily to set anything up, but it would be, you know, if they were going to set anything up to have success in the future, it would be setting up the relationships. Yeah. Take time now to form those proper relationships because they're the ones that are going to feed you in the future. And you mean the relationships with other people? Yeah. I mean, relationships with team members. I mean, relationships with clients. So when we go out and we interview different firms on the Business of Architecture podcast, one thing that is a common thread is that the people that go out and start their own practice where they've had a launching pad have already been working with and having great relationships with different clients, they're going to almost, they're going to start out with success. Even if they don't poach any of those clients, they're known in the industry. People know that they're out on their own. People will go there. And number two, if you've been working at a, at a firm where you had a team below you who, who likes you and respects you, a lot of times what we see is when these people leave the firms and go out and start their own thing, some of the people from the firm that they work with previously, or even in the distant past, actually go and move out to work with them. So one of the most challenging parts of building a successful practice is gathering the right people around you that you trust that can do good work and you can just unleash them and let them go instead of having to micromanage them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah. Micromanaging it can be a double-edged sword. You, you have to balance it. You know uh, what, when, when you start to work with companies, um, what, what are some of the common mistakes in the business practices that you see either stuff that they're not doing that they need to be doing things that they are doing that's wrong or unnecessary, or what, what kind of pops to the top of your head? 
Oh, yeah. yeah. So good question. There's, there's so many things. And again, there's, there's no shame in not knowing these things because they don't teach them to us. But I would say the primary thing in architecture that we as architects are guilty of doing is neglecting or dismissing the importance of money. Okay. And what I mean by that is if I had a dollar for every time an architect told me I didn't get into it for the money, the money's not important. I didn't mm -hmm. get into it to get rich. I would be a rich man just from every time I've heard that. Now, that may be true. We didn't get into architecture to be rich. But last time I checked, most people didn't get into architecture to be poor. Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure most people didn't go out trying to say, okay, I, I know I'm not going to get rich, but I want to be in poverty. No. Right. So there's this healthy balance of actually respecting money for what it is and valuing it as a highly priced commodity and something that's necessary for a business and for a practice. And so what I know from my own experience, Alex, is that I was never taught how to manage money. I was never taught about the power of investing, the difference between a cost and an investment. And that as you spend money in a practice, that's an investment. That's what gives dividends and helps you grow and make more money. Like I was never taught anything regarding that other than my parents told me to save, maybe put something away in a, in a, in a retirement account, but I never really learned how to make money or how to manage it. And as a result, what I did to sort of justify the fact that I wasn't making a lot of money is I told myself, well, money's not important. All those rich people, they just got there by exploiting other people, by being dishonest, by cheating, etc. So I put all these sort of justifications in my own personal mind as to why all those people were wrong. All the rich people were wrong. And I was somehow holy and I was better than them because I didn't have a lot of money. And I thought, well, you know, it's the price of doing the work that I love. I'm an architect. I'm yeah. doing amazing work. And, you know, I don't sell my soul for money, but it's a false dichotomy. So that would be the number one mistake that we see that, that really hurts firms. I, I would say one of the strategies I've used to get over that, because I've had that feeling, um, probably still do in some way, is I relate the decisions. Let's say it's uh, anywhere from $1,000 to $20,000 decision on, you know, like, are we going to be able to capture this value? Are we not? Are we giving the clients back? So, you know, like all these things that go on is I relate them to an item that costs that much. Like, mm, that's good. Do I want to just give up a brand new computer? <laughs> You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because someone at my firm or myself needs it, you know, like, yeah. do I want to give up a, a new car? Like, mm. no, I, I do not. Yeah. Um, so that, that conversion will, is what helped me. And it took me a while to realize that because yeah, as a business owner, you make thousand dollar decisions, you know, every week about something or another. Um, and then one time it hit me is like, man, this is a new computer. Like this, whatever decision is a new computer. And I go, I would really like a new computer. My computer is crapping out right now, you know? Um, so that's what that, that's one of my little tricks I have. Uh, that is a powerful, powerful strategy. Uh, it reminds me of one of my one of my early mentors, Eric Bobro. Some of you may know Eric, but I remember I was just barely in my in my in my stage of growth of of starting my own firm and my own practice. And you know, money was very tight. So I was trying to be very, very cautious about what I spent money on because there was not very much of it very, very careful about what I invested in. And, and Eric had a different mentality. So whenever he found a new software tool or something that would save him some time, automate something, basically get himself back some time, he would invest in it just without even questioning it. And so he had a couple thousand dollars a month that he was spending on software costs, just of software to kind of help him manage his life and get things done easier. And I was like, Eric, how can you justify that? He's like, well, what I've seen is that whenever there's something that's going to save me time, I will invest in that thing. If it's going to save me or my team time, if there's a faster, more efficient way where I don't have to worry about, it, I'm going to do it. And I saw the fruits because at the time, Eric's salary was like four times my mine was. And I, I'm like, it just blew my mind. I'm like, this is a completely new paradigm of looking at things as not costs, but looking as, at them as investments. And when I made that shift, just that one simple shift has been probably one of the biggest shifts that I've made in being able to have more resource flow into my life to do better stuff. Is because yeah. I went from a cost focus to an investment focus. That's that's really nice. Um, what are you seeing a trend towards, or any kind of things that you see exciting in the realm of firms automating task or thing or, uh, yeah, task is I guess is the right term. Absolutely, there's there's so much that can be automated. You're probably on the cutting edge of it. 
you know, being a younger firm, but there's so many things now that can be completely, completely automated client onboarding. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's so many things. And a lot of the, the cool part is a lot of the stuff that could be automated is stuff that currently isn't even happening that probably should be happening. So for instance, uh, let's say you get a new team member. It would, wouldn't it be great to have an onboarding process for this team member where they just get kind of get set up in the system and then boom, brrr, they get these automatic emails every single day that walks them through a particular training program so they can understand how our firm works. They can understand how we do things. How much time would that save you and your team if you had that all on autopilot? Well, now probably in most small firms, there's nothing even close to that. Probably now it's like, hey, jump into it. Go check out some of our old drawings. Um, here's Tanya right here. She's been here for a couple of years. She can answer any questions for you. Let me know if you have any questions. Let's get after it, right? Yep. That's the typical way to do it, okay? So many firms might look at it and like, well, you know, it's an extra expense. Why would I want to automate all this? We're not doing it now anyways, and it seems to be working just fine the way it is. What they're not seeing is the benefit that happens when those things, once those things are actually in place, the longevity of your employees, the engagement of your employees, the ability to have to focus. Now they're talking about your firm and saying, dude, this firm, we're on point over here. It's amazing. They're recruiting now for you and you're getting other team members on board. So there's all sorts of hidden costs as well as hidden benefits to being on the cutting edge of things like automation. And there's, it's so underutilized right now. One of the things that we do with our clients actually is we call it an automation masterclass where we walk them through all the different processes in a firm and expose them to how each one of these things can be automated so that they can set something up once and then just have it completely on autopilot after that. Very nice. I like that. Um, let's, where do I want to take this? Okay, let's, if you were going to uh, design a college course, all right, and I agree with you that most of it needs to be spent on design and, and there's a lot of different areas, but let's say this is a summer elective that they can take. How would you structure it to kind of have them do what you have already laid out, get a love for, arc, uh, for the business side? Because I feel like a lot of pro practice courses, um, and even if you try to talk code, in college, it's it's not related to anything. It's like, here's the code book, or even I remember like sections and detailing drawings. He would just draw sections and talk about them and they were cool, but it's like, that doesn't relate to, to, to anything whatsoever. Um, so if you were having the task of a college course, what would be your idea about how to get them engaged in the business of architecture side? Okay, so the intention is uh, we have a group of smart, uh, smart and engaged and interested college students, we need to teach them a course where they're going to kind of get this love for the business. Is that, is that the yeah. intention of the course? Yep. Okay. So what I would do is I would, I would structure the course through some experiences. So I would make it experiential, you know, something now what that means. I don't know. I mean, you're just asking me, this is making this up off the cuff. Yeah. But yeah. I think some of the best forms of learning are experiential. So what I mean by experiential is not just a lecture format, but something where you're actively participating, like the rural studio that Sam Mockby started, right? We all know in the architecture industry, that's a really cool, different learning environment or pedagogy. So number one, I make it experiential. Number two, I would help the students understand that business and understanding business is about really managing money and, and building money, making money, and that ultimately that's linked up to design. So if you want to do great design, it's going to be very, very difficult to do that without some sort of money. So I'd link the two. I'd say, look, these are necessary. If you want to be a crappy designer and you just want to have, can I swear on this project, yeah. on this podcast? Yep. If you want to have ship, ship, ship projects, then you know, go ahead, forget about the money. Just go you know, be, be poor and struggle and try to get what you can, whatever, right? or try to win some competitions by doing free work. And maybe you'll succeed by the time you're 60 and get noticed by someone. Yeah. Be my guess. There's a lot of firms yep. that do that and it works for 5% of them. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of competition there. There's a lot of competition there. Plus there's not a lot of rewards. So, or you can go path B, which is learn how to master the business. And now you have a solid foundation of finances. And then you can leverage that into any kind of exposure that you want. Let's face it, when the coffers are full and you can pay for PR and you can pay for business development and you can pay for relationships and you can pay for getting new clients and you can pay for going to competitions and you can pay for going to things like MIMPIM, which is the, the big conference that happens out in Europe, you know, whatever it needs to happen to be able to build the practice you're going to be able to do those things. So that's what I would do. I would just concentrate the whole course on understanding that one simple concept, which is that 
your ability as a, to run a successful business, in other words, to make abundance of money can either accelerate the craft or it can make the craft more difficult. So partner or discover it yourself. If you don't want to learn it yourself, bring someone in who does know the business because it's really hard to build a practice when you're struggling for, for money and finances. Yeah. Yeah. So what is, could you kind of give an overview of what your smart practice method is? Because that's your course that you're, that you have out there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the smart practice method is more than a course. So it's not just a course. It's actually, um, we, we call it a program, but what we mean by that is it's a custom tailored solution where we take a look at what a practice already has in place. We see what's missing and we help them add what's missing to be able to get the end result that they want, whether that's more freedom, whether that's more money, whether it's better projects, like that's what ultimately what the smart practice method is about. Okay. Now there's four different parts of smart practice method. There's, and we call them the four playbooks. All right. So when we look at, and this is something we've developed over the past 10 years, but when we looked at the different practices that were successful, or when we looked at the practices that weren't successful, or maybe we're struggling because both of those are, you know, they, they both provide useful information. What we discovered that there were some commonalities. So the first playbook is what we call the purpose playbook. It's kind of what we talked about at the beginning of the podcast today. And there's some specific things that need to happen to make sure that a firm has a strong and powerful purpose. We identify three things. Number one is passion. Number two are principles. And number three is the path. Okay. So that's what we call the purpose playbook. Now, in addition to that, the other three playbooks would be the people playbook, the profit playbook, and the process playbook. Okay. So we're looking at purpose. We're looking at people. We're looking at profit and process. And if any one of these things is out of alignment or any one of these things is missing or maybe not fully developed or not in place, it's going to cause problems in the practice that the firm owner is going to be dealing with things like spending too much time on admin things like, you know, getting to the end of a, we've, we've run out of the fee, but we have more project yep. to do, you know, things like that. So that's what the smart practice method is. And what we do is we just take these simple tried and true methods, tools, and templates based upon these four playbooks. And we help small firm owners implement them in their practice over the course of generally firms hires for about a year, but it may take one to, you know, one to three years. It's more of a long-term thing because they want lasting change. They want lasting what value. Do you call it lasting value. Yeah. So we help them ultimately what we do is it's more than a course because we've been through a lot of courses before we've had courses. Courses are great. We used to it, this actually used to be more of a course format where people would come on board and be like a 90 day course where they'd walk through it over 90 days. But what we found is that people would go through the course and then they wouldn't implement half the things. Yeah. And so because they didn't implement, they didn't get the results. They had the knowledge, but they didn't actually get the results that they could have gotten at the end of the day. So we said, okay, whoop, let's slow it down. We're going to space it out over however long it takes. It depends on the firm. It may take a year. It may take a couple of years right? But let's face it. If you look ahead to a year from now or two years from now or three years from now, you're either going to be in the same place you are now, or you're going to be at the place where you have something like the smart practice method completely installed in the practice. All right. So what we found, slow it down, focus on embedding, focus on making the changes. And that's how you get lasting results. I, I would agree that there's a hierarchy of, of what you can do. Um, and yeah? everything Tell me about and, that. Well, essentially, you know, let's say you buy a book. Um, one is called mm. like, uh, there's a bunch of ones, but you know, you'll read a book and your implementation will probably be one, possibly two of those ideas, like, yeah. but probably just one. And there was probably yeah. 10 good ideas in that book, but you did one. Then you could buy a course. And like you said, that's what happened. Now you're doing like two to five of whatever they said out of the maybe 50 things that you need to do. You got five, you know? Um, when you do a program or have a mentor or have something with that long term, it, you know, I, I'm not going to, let's say you're hitting 90, you know, you might say hundred, that's fine. But it, I mean, 90 compared to 5% is worlds of difference. I know worlds of difference. Guilty as charged. And I mean, I, I recently gave away like a thousand dollars in books because I'm, I'm the guy, I'm the most guilty guy on the planet for buying a book, looking at it, you know, kind of getting a couple of cool thoughts about it and then not reading the rest. So yeah. I bought so many courses. I bought so many books. I, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have a 15 minute, no obligation call. What is that about? What are you trying to get out of that? 
Yeah. So what we, what we offer firms, thanks for asking what we offer small firms uh, to, to be able to just find out more about what we do. So if it's fit to work together is what we call a 15 minute, just a hello call. And that's just, you know, there's nothing for sale on that call. You know, you couldn't buy anything if you wanted to, it's just a chance for you to hop on with us and we can have a chat and then see if it makes sense to have a further conversation about installing the smart practice method in your practice, seeing if what we do can help you get more freedom, get more fulfillment, um, and ultimately get more financial reward in your practice. So, you know, businesses owners can find that if they just go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart. And there's a page there where they can request uh, an evaluation. And the first part of that is just that free 15 minute call. Yeah. Uh, and then also side benefits, become a better father, become a better mother, oh my goodness. become a better partner. Um, yes. Yes. All through freeing up time. I love that. You know, it, this is, this is something that I discovered really, I kind of knew it all along, but I've discovered it more and more recently is that these, what we call the core four areas of life, we call it body being balance and business. So these kind of cover the bodies to be your health and your fitness, your being your connection to God, or your connection to yourself, the universe, whatever you call it, your balance, your connection with friends, family, and your spouse. And lastly, your business, like these four areas, if any one of these areas is off kilter or out of line, it's going to affect every other area. You know, like for instance, my wife and I, we had a disagreement this weekend. I was feeling terrible. I was feeling inadequate as a husband, inadequate as a father, beating myself up mentally. Here I go again. Why yeah. can't I ever get it right? You know? And then I just remember just Monday and Tuesday, it was just as a struggle to get out of bed. I didn't show up as my best self when I was on, on my calls and doing what I had to do throughout the day. And so I've really seen, so I love you brought that up because it's more than just balance. It's more than work-life balance. It's about really integrating all four of these areas and having it all. So we really believe, and we've seen it happen again and again and again, that you as an individual, you can have it all. You can live a life where you have all four of these things in abundance. And it is just an incredible place to be at. So I'd invite everyone to, if you're in a difficult spot in your relationship with your spouse, uh, in a relationship with God, in your business, or with friends and family, or your health, press on, good soldier because it's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. You do the work and the results eventually they'll get there. And I know that because I've seen that through my own life and the people we work with. Absolutely. Okay. Last thing, uh, where can people get a hold of you? Where should they go to kind of check you out or engage? Yeah. First place is just go. If you're a podcast listener, um, look up the business of architecture podcast. We'd love to have you as beyond your list of podcasts that you listen to go to podcasts. I'll be the first to admit not every podcast is going to be a golden hit, <laughs> um, but you know, if you listen, you'll find some golden nuggets in there and we really do our best to make it at least half as good as inside the firm. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully it can uh, live up to that, but that's the first place. The second place is just go to businessofarchitecture.com. on that main page. There's a masterclass there where we go over the smart practice method. It's a free 60 minute training. Um, there's an invitation at the end of that training to have a talk with us, but obviously that's not necessary. So that's going to be an incredible business education for anyone who feels like they want to dip their toe and thinking, what might I be missing? You know, what might I be missing in terms of the business? Maybe I've, I'm good right now, but could there, is there something I can be doing to go to great? Then go into businessofarchitecture.com and just right there on the homepage, clicking the button for the free video will be, will be a good place to start. Awesome. Sounds great. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. You're welcome, Alex. Thank you for having me here. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by business of architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you Conquer the world. Carpe diem.